Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's Anniversary Edition. My name is Camel, but more excitingly, however, welcome back to a new episode of the Elder Scrolls Detective series. It's a series in which we investigate, curate, speculate, hypothesize, theorize, and quite often simply highlight and discuss interesting, mysterious, and hidden things that can be found within the Elder Scrolls games. Today we will be deep diving and conducting a thorough investigation into who I would quite confidently call, across all planes of existence, yes even Link, the most disliked character in Skyrim. You know him, you probably hate him, you might have even killed him. The alleged King of the Cloud District, the man himself, Nazim. God, he's punchable. Now you might be wondering why Nazim, as he just comes across as an overly annoying anomaly, so why spend another second staring at this smirking mug? Well, as we will discover, there are many hidden details about Nazim that are easily missed, and I think that you will find very interesting. Now, if this kind of stuff does interest you, be sure to check out my other Elder Scrolls Detective videos that I have already done. They can be found down in the description via the Elder Scrolls Detective playlist link. Now, down there in the description, you can also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. And be sure to head over to the merch store, which has over 100 items which have been carefully crafted for lovers of the Elder Scrolls, like this Camel Elder Scrolls blanket designed by yours truly. It keeps you warm and up to date with lore while you watch these videos. But for now, let us compose, muster, bolster and buff our patience and tolerance skills all the way to 100 as we venture into the beautiful Oriate Tundra of Skyrim to the hold of Whiterun, wherein the major city bears the same name, Whiterun. Outside of its gates, rolling golden grassy knolls stretch to the near horizon, bordered by picturesque snow-capped mountains. The stout stone walls of the burg are cinched by fields, farms, and the general folk. A brook babbles peacefully, sculpting serpentine gullies through the soil. Butterflies flitter in the open air, making frequent pauses between nectar-rich flora. We can spot the everyman going about their business, farmers rake and hoe, stable hands feed the horses, guards patrol the roads, stopping occasionally to bestow passers-by with anecdotes about fletched shafts piercing their midleg. As quaint and homely as this setting is, our subject lies within the city itself. So once we've passed Whiterun's grand gates, we'll spot all walks of life churning on with the wheel of time. Children run through the streets playing tag, smiths hone their craft, clinking and clanking away, shaping refined ore to their clients' wants. Merchants spruik their wares in the market, the mad prophet gives his sermon and the general populace go about their routine tasks. But there is one man, one voice that can cut through the tranquility and quotidian nature of the cityscape. One who can ruin our days within these walls like no other. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. Ugh. Already, with one line delivered, we're going, ugh, not him. Which, in my mind, might concrete the sentiment that Nazim may just be the most well-crafted, non-interactable slash not-so-important NPC in the game. Think about it, he might be one of the most recognizable characters within Skyrim. While yes, he's annoying, to say the least, from a writing perspective, creating a side character that everyone knows? Well, that's a really successful character. But to love him, as if, or hate him, we need to ask the questions, who is Nazim? Who is Nazim really? And what is going on with his life, behind the smirks and arrogance? Well, to find the answers, we will need to be extremely brave and actually talk with Nazim to see what we can find out. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. Yes, I do, and courtesy of a long and complicated Twitch stream, you too, Nazim, can now go to your beloved Cloud District. Oh, that's so much better with him up there. He's now happy, but more importantly, we're happy and free of him. Well, for a short time until he falls back to Tamriel like an ethereal fragment. But okay, okay, humorous fantasies aside, what else will he reveal to us? Oh, it took years, but I earned my way to the top. I own Chilfero Farm, you see. Very successful business, obviously. 
I actually advise the Jarl on political matters. My input is invaluable, of course. But this is all probably a bit over your head. Now, as much as we want to give Nazim something that won't go over his head, this is actually all Nazim has to say. Although, if we head to the Whiterun markets during the morning between 9 and midday, we can both witness and listen to Nazim bothering all of the merchants. As he spouts his frivolous and frankly unwelcome opinions about how inferior their wares are. First on the chopping block, pun intended, is the Bosma hunter and butcher, Anoriath. Do you have anything even remotely fresh? I can assure you it's all fresh. I hunt the game myself every day. Hmm. As you say. Maybe you'd like to try the horker or some beef. You don't prepare the meat with any of those strange elven spices, do you? Ah, no, no elven spices, just some salt to preserve it. You're not afraid of salt, are you? I'm not afraid of anything. I simply prefer quality merchandise. No, no, this meat won't do at all. Too much fat. And it all smells wrong. Suit yourself, then. The woods are that way, outside the walls. Walk straight ahead, can't miss them. Good luck on your hunt. Good day. As we will discover later, and please remember this line, if there is one man who knows a good piece of meat, it's Nazim. However, for now, Nazim's next target is Yazolda, a young Nord woman who is actually involved with the other dimensional sleeping tree. If you are unfamiliar with the sleeping tree from another dimension, well, be sure to check the video above. I think you'll find it very interesting. But for now, back to Nazim. Ah, Isolda, was it? What brings you to the market? I'm here to buy food, Nazim. I suppose you don't need to worry about that. Owning a farm does have its advantages. And finally, we will move on to the Imperial Grocer, Carlotta. Hmm. These fruits and vegetables are disappointing, Carlotta. I get them fresh from the farms daily, Nazim. If you were getting them from my farm, they'd be twice as fresh. And that is that. That is all Nazim has to say in game, apart from some other general lines like Need make something. It quick. I haven't got all day. Yes. Make it quick. Speak. Now, Nazim is not involved in any quests in Skyrim, although I will say technically he is potentially involved in two quests. Firstly is the Companion's Quest Rescue Mission, in which we will have to go and rescue someone who has been kidnapped. However, this quest has a big long list of NPCs and locations that it randomly chooses from, one of which just so happens to be Nazim. So when you pick this quest up, you might actually be asked to rescue Nazim. Now I cannot be certain mathematically, but in my heart of hearts, I am sure that no one has ever completed this quest to rescue Nazim. Hell, to be honest, we're probably the ones that paid for his kidnapping in the first place. But secondly is the companion's quest hired muscle, in which we will need to rough someone up to get them to pay a debt. Just like the previous quest, this one has a long list of NPCs that it will randomly select from. And once again, Nazim can be the target for this quest, which let's be honest, has got to be the best quest in Skyrim. Getting paid to punch Nazim in the face, or oh, to batter his smug mug, drive a few jabs into his kidneys. Oh, God damn it, that's a good quest. It's such a dream come true that even this fish had to perform some tonal architecture and stretch its neck, breaking the laws of physics and reality, just to witness the beautiful event of Nazim taking a Daedric gauntlet to the face. And given that this salmon has already been caught, he now knows what a damn good hook looks like. But anyway, if you are lucky enough to get this quest, then you've been truly blessed. But satisfaction and violent fantasies aside, Nazim is not involved in any other quests of note. And as we've seen, he has very limited dialogue. So at face value, Nazim comes across as a pompous, self-inflated, walking, talking hemorrhoid that cannot be cured by any mystical salve. He's so insufferable, in fact, that if so happens to mysteriously die, his remains may not spawn within the hall of the dead within Whiterun. Not even the afterlife wants anything to do with him. Anyway, Nazim is supposedly a wealthy businessman 
who wears expensive fine clothing and loiters about the streets of Whiterun telling all of his successes. He owns a farm and is, in his own words, an indispensable advisor to the Jarl of Whiterun. All the while, he's happily married to his beautiful wife, Alam. But is this what Nazim's life is truly like? Well, as you might have guessed, no, no it is not. So sit tight as we discover the truth behind this boastful humgruffin. Firstly, let's take a good look at what Nazim actually does, as his daily activities, while seeming mundane, do in fact reveal a lot. He will wake at 8am and head to the markets to snobbishly berate the stall sellers, as we saw earlier. Then at noon, he will do loops around the city, walking from the Plains District up to the Winds District and back down again, soaking in the atmosphere and looking for targets to be judged by unwanted words from his ninny hammer mouth. Then rolls around 4pm, which is his quaff tide, as he will return to the Drunken Huntsman where he lives with his wife Alarm, and here he will drink alone, occasionally stopping to stir the pot of stew or sit down and eat. And whenever he does take a seat, even the food tries to escape his presence. Then at 8pm, he will go upstairs to sleep, where he rests for 12 hours before waking up at 8am and repeating this process every single day. Now again, while at face value, yes, that's a pretty dull existence, interestingly, his actions seem to unravel a lot of his own claims. Firstly, Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. The Cloud District, what does that actually mean? Well, the city of Whiterun is comprised of three main districts, which in height and socio-economics literally go from lowest to highest. Firstly is the Plains District, which to put it simply is the kind of lower class general man district. There are market stalls, taverns, tradesmen, small houses. It's where the everyday average person lives and goes about their business. Above this is the Wind District. This is the kind of upper middle class district, so to speak. There are larger houses, buildings and locations of significance like the Halls of the Dead, the Statue of Talos, the Temple of Kinnereth, the Sky Forge, the Gildegreen Tree, and the Companions Guild Hall, Yorvaskar. And then above this is the ever so esteemed Cloud District, which didn't get all the love it needed really. All that is housed here is the Seat of the Jarl, or to put it simply, basically the Castle of Whiterun, known as Dragon's Reach. Now, the Cloud District was actually supposed to be a bigger area, holding a few large manors belonging to the affluent and important inhabitants of Whiterun. So, the Cloud District is supposed to be this area, this kind of place that you do not go unless you are of a high enough social status, or you have a very important reason, or you've been summoned by someone who is important to travel up to that mythical Cloud District. So, when Nazim says this, do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. What he's actually saying is that we, the mere Dragonborn, are obviously not important enough or wealthy enough to ever have a reason to visit the esteemed Cloud District of the city, while at the same time flexing that he is important enough. But what is interesting and actually very ironic is that yes, we the player do in fact go to the Cloud District very often. And secondly, as we know from Nazim's own daily schedule, he himself actually never once visits the Cloud District. Along with this, the Yal never mentions Nazim, nor does anyone in Dragon's Reach. And building from this, when Nazim says this, I actually advise the Jarl on political matters. My input is invaluable, of course. But this is all probably a bit over your head. Well, the Jarl never mentions Nazim, nor does anyone else in Dragon's Reach. It's almost as if Nazim does not exist to them. So as far as in-game evidence goes, Nazim being in the Cloud District and advising the Jarl appear to be a complete fabrication. He never speaks to the Jarl, or for that matter, he never even goes near the Cloud District or into Dragon's Reach, so it would seem that no, Nazim does not advise the Jarl, which would mean that no, Nazim is not as important as he makes himself out to be. Or in fact, he's not really of any importance at all. Okay, well if all of that seems to be a big fat lie, what about Chilfaro Farm? Is this also a fib? Well, 
Luckily for Nazim, he does actually own Chilfaro Farm. The game files do reveal this, and of course some of the other NPCs reference him owning a farm. Ah, Isolde was it? What brings you to the market? I'm here to buy food, Nazim. I suppose you don't need to worry about that. Owning a farm does have its advantages. But again, rather strangely, Nazim never actually goes there, despite Chilfara Farm just being outside the walls of the city of Whiterun. However, this is due to a bug in the game files. But with the Skyrim unofficial patch, Nazim will visit Chilfara Farm on Lordus and Sundus. Lordus and Sundus being Saturday and Sunday within the Elder Scrolls universe. But even with this bug fixed, Nazim and Alarm still don't live at the farm. Nazim will just visit it on the weekends. Instead, the farm is run by a Nord named Wilmuth, who doesn't provide any dialogue apart from standard passing lines like, Let's hear it. Come, come, I haven't got all day. Need something? So in our quest to reveal Nazim's secrets, well, Wilmuth won't tell. His name should be Will, not Mouth. Strangely though, Wilmoth doesn't seem to be a good farmer, often doing things that don't look really remotely useful to the farm's well-being. Even the chickens are confused by his actions. Although I'm sure we can just boil this down to the very likely explanation of janky in-game animations. But there is another strange Wilmoth fact that I found. As in Skyrim, there are a list of classes, and each NPC has an assigned class, generally to best reflect their place within the world. For example, Severio Pelagia is a farmer who works at the Pelagia farm, and his class is, you guessed it, farmer. Gwendolyn is a farmer who works at Battleborn Farm, and her class is, that's right, farmer. Wilmoth is a farmer who works at Chilfaro Farm, and his class is not farmer, but instead he is a combat elemental mage. Huh? What? Well, this is made even stranger by the fact that within the Elder Scrolls, the race most adverse to magic are Nords. So a Nord combat elemental mage would be the rarest kind within the parameters of the 10 playable races, of course. Yet this Nord combat elemental mage tends to a farm that's strange, no? This sure does Nazim to make sense. I personally can't make head nor tail of it. Maybe you can figure this one out. Why on earth is Chilfara Farm run by a combat elemental mage? When every other farmer that I inspected in the game files is in fact classed as a farmer. Yet they ship this guy in straight from the College of Winterhold. I don't get it. Anyway, here at Chilfara Farm, wheat is produced and cabbage is grown, along with two chickens for eggs and a cow for milk. There is also a mill to grind the wheat down into flour. I find the flour mill rather ironic, as unsurprisingly, the mill goes around and around milling. And it's owned by Nazim, who appears to have taken influence, as what does Nazim do all day? He mills around and around the streets of Whiterun, like a goldfish. Anyway, I snooped about within the residence of Chilfara Farm, which, to be honest, seems quite lavish compared to where Nazim and Alam live. There are a few rooms and plenty of space. The shelves are teeming and the stores are fully stocked. And while prodding around looking for dirt on Nazim, I couldn't find anything in here. Although rather strangely, on top of the cupboard within the storeroom, we can find some nice juicy ribs. But this ain't just any old meat. This is in fact dog meat and not the Fallout 3 companion. Now dog meat, even within Skyrim, is not a normal cuisine to partake in. Unless of course you're a bandit in Riften. And if you want to know what that means, click the video link above for the uh, twist tale of a canine category. But why is there butchered dog meat ready to be cooked at Nazim's farm? I'm entirely unsure but thought it strange enough to mention. Now, the only other thing of note that I could find in here was in Wilmoth's bedroom, where there is a one-handed skill book titled The Importance of Wear. Now, that's just fine, but if you really think about it, why would a combat elemental mage farmer need to be brushing up on their one-handed skills? Well, they probably wouldn't. You might be thinking for self-defense or protecting the farm, but that basically goes out the window considering that the farms of Whiterun are so heavily guarded by the actual guards of the city and the state who are constantly patrolling the perimeter at all times of day. 
So what else could Wilmoth, a lonely man, be getting up to in his bedroom, where the book is found, that requires one hand? Hmm, um, oh, you know what, let's not dally on this topic. Now something else I noticed was that Chilfara Farm isn't actually very impressive at all. It's quite small and doesn't seem to produce anything of value, especially when compared to the other farms around the city of Whiterun or something in Whiterun like Rorikstead, which is far more palatial, verdant and crop filled. Although if you've seen my deep dive into the dark truth of Rorikstead, then you'll know why the crops have grown so well. But here at the rather meager Chilfaro farm, we can find cabbage and wheat, with probably enough chicken eggs and milk to feed one person maybe, and I'd imagine that Wilmoth is eating that. So with this in mind, we can fairly accurately surmise that most of the profit comes from the cabbage and flour both of which are as cheap as sand in elsewhere. And along with their lack of monetary value, there's only 10 heads of cabbage and seven sheafs of wheat. So this would not generate much income at all. And along with this unimpressive harvest, let's not forget that Nazim says this. Hmm, these fruits and vegetables are disappointing, Carlotta. I get them fresh from the farms daily, Nazim. If you were getting them from my farm, they'd be twice as fresh. This is interesting because Nazim's farm is in Whiterun. Nazim lives in Whiterun. Nazim is a businessman in Whiterun, yet the local Whiterun businesses are not buying his produce. So who is buying his produce? Is anyone? Maybe they're not. Is that why Nazim puts on such an aggressive front of being a wealthy, important businessman? Because he's in complete denial of the dire bankruptcy that is his actual reality. Well, this could be, as after all, while he does dress in schmick fine clothing, his lovely wife Alarm wears regular clothing, which doesn't exactly portray wife of rich businessman energy. But before we move on from the farm, there is one humorous puff, if I may call it that, that I sniffed out while digging around here. That being Nazim's farmstead grows cabbages. Now, cabbages are a cruciferous vegetable, which just so happens to be a group of vegetables that cause excessive flatulence. So if you really want to boil it down, Nazim is the king of cabbage, which makes him the king of uh, farting. Perhaps this is Nazim's cloud district, a cloud district of his own making. I mean, is he just walking around high and delusional in a haze of his own cheek squeak? Well, with this in mind, I think he should look at buying property in the wind district. And ironically, his wife Alam is a priestess of Kinnereth, who is the goddess of wind. Now, with snickering muses aside and speaking of property, we still need to find out everything we can about Nazim. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. Do you own a home in Whiterun? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. Yes, that's right. Despite owning Chilfaro Farm, Nazim and his wife Alam do not live there. Instead, the two of them rent a room in the attic of the hunting store, the Drunken Huntsman. And yes, while the Drunken Huntsman is a hunting store and a bit of a watering hole in the afternoons, it's not actually a tavern, as we the player cannot rent a room there as there are no free rooms. So Nazim and Alam are simply boarding the attic for a place to live, which once again doesn't extreme rich successful businessmen. But while we are on the topic, remember at the market when Nazim was saying all of this. Do you have anything even remotely fresh? I can assure you it's all fresh. I hunt the game myself every day. Hmm. As you say. Maybe you'd like to try the horker or some beef. You don't prepare the meat with any of those strange elven spices, do you? Ah, no, no elven spices, just some salt to preserve it. You're not afraid of salt, are you? I'm not afraid of anything. I simply prefer quality merchandise. No, no, this meat won't do at all. Too much fat. And it all smells wrong. Suit yourself, then. The woods are that way, outside the walls. Walk straight ahead, can't miss them. Good luck on your hunt. Good day. Well, it turns out that Anoriath, the Wood Elf Huntsman, Nazim is grilling about how crap his meat is. Well, this is actually his landlord. 
Imagine the deluded pomposity one would require to actively seek out your landlord's place of business and heckle them about how subpar their wares are. God sees such a slime ball. Anyway, that's all well and good, but this self-proclaims rich businessman of great importance lives in the attic of a hunting store in the Plains District, which is the lowest of the districts within Whiterun, both literally and in terms of social class. So, to me at least, this does not ring the bell of success. However, I do believe that there is a very good explanation for this seemingly odd location of occupancy for both Nazim and his wife. But we will get to that in a minute, as it's all wrapped up in the thickest of plot twists. But for now, as we've inspected just about every other part of Nazim's life, it's time for us to suss out his wife, Alarm. She will sleep with Nazim in the attic of the hunting store, the Drunken Huntsman. Alarm will arise at 9am, whereupon she will travel to her workplace at the Temple of Kinnereth, where she spends her day healing. Although there is something sussy about this as well, but again, we'll get to that a little later because it's funny. But anyway, at midday, Alarm will head outside and take rest on a bench beneath the Gildegreen tree at the center of the Wind District. At 4 p.m., she will return to the temple and continue with her duties there. Then, after a very long day, at 9 p.m., she will head back to the Drunken Huntsman, where she will go upstairs and stare at her husband, Nazim, sleeping. At midnight, she will finally get to bed before repeating this process every single day. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that when I went to get footage of her and Nazim sleeping in bed together, which sounds sus, but you know, it's part of the job, Alarm did not go to bed at all. She stood awake all night, standing, staring at the wall, which seems to imply that she's having a pretty tough time. And relating to this, rather interestingly, or perhaps worryingly, Alarm and Nazim never actually interact once at all. In fact, in the afternoons, while Nazim does hot laps of the city, he will pass by his wife Alarm as she sits beneath the Gildegreen tree, several times in fact, and he will not say a word. But then again, neither does she. They both just act as if the other does not exist. Certainly at face value, this does not imply true love. But you know what? Let's not judge a book by its cover, even though that's correct 99% of the time. Maybe we're just reading into this wrong. We're not. But let's see what Alarm has to say. Looking for my husband, Nazim? Check the Jarl's backside. That's usually where he stuffs himself these days. Damn, that's a pretty aggro line. And uh, there actually might be more to it, but we'll touch on that towards the end of the video when everything unravels. But as for now, we have more cherished words from Alarm to listen to. Men are all alike, from Skyrim to Hammerfell. They care only for war and politics and treat their women like cattle. Like cattle? What, is he milking you? Are you married? You look the type. Make sure you treat your wife with the respect she deserves. Divine. Here you stand, talking to a married woman. Why? Am I that interesting? Or perhaps there are other things on your mind. <laughs> other things on my mind. Let's get back to the milk. I mean, the uh, obviously the, the milk of the investigation. So as we can see, we definitely were not reading into the situation incorrectly. In fact, it's worse than we thought. And that's not the end of it either. As within the Temple of Kinnereth, where Alarm works, well, we can see her having a chat with Danica Pure Spring, And it is quite the conversation to overhear. Something wrong, Alarm? Huh? Oh, well... To be honest, I was thinking of Nazim. The gap between us seems to be widening. He's just so... self-absorbed. If you don't mind me saying so, Alam, your husband is a damn fool. Any moment spent thinking about him is a moment wasted. Maybe Nazim's obsession has merit. This civil war seems so big, so unceasing. I'm afraid, Danica. Afraid for us all. Now, now, my friend. You must look on the bright side. If soldiers storm the city, there's a good chance your husband may get killed. Oh, you are terrible. You do know that, right? <laughs> so not only does Alarm truly dislike her husband, but even Danica Pure Spring cannot help but express how much of a buffoon Nazim is. So it would seem that no one likes Nazim. 
and before you spare a shred of, no, poor him. No, he's paying for his actions. That's exactly what he gets for being an insufferable oaf. Just as one plus one equals two, it is also mathematically true that arrogance plus condescendence times dickhead to the power of smug equals no one likes you. So if you do want to jump on the no train, no for alarm. I mean, honestly, her life sounds pretty sad. She probably bases her work days around not seeing Nazim. Don't forget, she wakes up after Nazim has already left and she goes to bed well after Nazim has already gone to sleep. The only time they spend together is when they're not awake. So all in all, it would seem that Nazim is far less, many pegs below what he claims to be. Most people don't even mention him, and those few that do, do not show any love for him at all. Unfortunately for him, this includes his wife, although it seems to be his own doing. So thus far, this investigation has gone from he's really annoying to he's just a big sad sack of failure. Oh well, that's Nazim. Or is it? No, no it's not, as I've discovered some very hidden details and connected little known facts to potentially reveal something very, very interesting. Now I will say that we need to take some of this with a pinch of fire salts, as it is somewhat based around cut content, or more importantly, in-game fragments of cut content. What does this mean? Well, let me show you. If we pickpocket Nazim, we can find some random level loot, yes of course, along with the key to Chilfara Farm, makes sense, he owns the farm, but we can also find a key to Wintersand Manor. Where is Wintersand Manor, you may ask? Well, it's not in the game. However, within the creation kit, we can find Wintersand Manor location files, which locate it within the city of Whiterun. But while there are location files for Wintersand Manor within the creation kit, there are no asset files or values of any kind other than it being located within Whiterun. So we simply cannot know what it was meant to look like. And because of that, we cannot accurately recreate it with mods. But luckily, knowing of its planned existence is far more important than its appearance as we'll discover in the next couple of minutes. Now, Nazim's wife, Alam, also carries a key to Wintersand Manor. Along with this, within the creation kit, we can see that both Nazim and Alam belong to the Wintersand Manor faction, along with belonging to the Wintersand Manor luck list. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, fair play. Don't worry, I gotcha. These two tags mean that Nazim and Alam would respond appropriately if someone stole from Wintersand Manor or was caught lockpicking the lock or stealing something or something of the sort. Every NPC in the game belongs to a faction or a couple of factions so that if you break into their house and steal something, they go, oi, get out of my house, that's mine, something along those lines. So when I say that Nazim and Alam would react appropriately within Wintersand Manor, I mean react as if they owned Wintersand Manor. And on top of this, Nazim and Alam are the only two characters in the game to belong to this faction and the lock list as well. Now with this information, we can use our big brains to conclude that Wintersand Manor was meant to be a huge house that Nazim and Alam owned and lived in, which was likely meant to be located within the Cloud District, and this would explain why Nazim always yips and yaps about it. And if it was located in the Cloud District, this would make Nazim actually an NPC, a character, a person within Skyrim of great importance and social influence and rank within society, which would then of course accurately reflect how he portrays himself. Now along with this, their home that they never got is referred to as a manor, which none of the other houses in Whiterun are referred to as, which means that it would have been notably larger than any of the other housing that we find in Whiterun apart from, of course, Dragon's Reach, because that's like the castle. And on top of this, I have something that took a really goddamn long time to find. The original design document for the city of Whiterun, shown during a presentation by Emil Pegililililero. Pronunciation meaning no offense, of course, I just cannot pronounce that guy's last name. Anyway, Whiterun's original design document. We can see that up in the Cloud District, along with Dragon's Reach, there are also two large buildings. Well, 
Winter Scent Manor was likely meant to be one of these two large, extravagant and important buildings. But in the final version of Skyrim, there was simply not enough room in the Cloud District for these buildings to be placed there. Nor was there room anywhere else in the city to fit big old Winter Sand Manor. So what ended up happening? Instead, it was never implemented into the game, which rendered Nazim and Alam homeless, which is of course what led to their obscure bunkings within the attic of the Drunken Huntsman. Suddenly the devs have got these two homeless NPCs, they gotta stick them somewhere in a random bed. That's where they ended up. So it would seem that there were much bigger plans for Nazim that simply never made it into the game. But it seems they didn't really change the character, so he still walks around as if he's this big wig living in the Cloud District, which of course explains why it doesn't really make much sense that he's walking around a successful businessman and then living in an attic in the Plains District. Ugh. But that's not all, as this plot is about to get thick. And when I say thick, I mean Nord thick. As we know, Alam and Nazim carry keys to their Winter Sand Manor. And that Alam is extremely unhappy in her marriage and dissatisfied with her husband Nazim. To escape him, she spends most of her day in the Temple of Kinnereth, where she works with Danica Puerspring and Akalaj Jensen, a strapping Nord man, who she stares at a lot throughout the day. Could Nazim's failures as a husband have led Alam to have eyes for someone else? Seems a little preposterous, or does it? As if we do the right thing for this investigation and pickpocket this stud, Acolyte Jensen, well, 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 what do we have here? Interesting. A key to Wintersand Manor. Uh oh, alarm bells are going off. Why would Acolyte Jensen have a key to alarm and Nazim's house? Well, the answer is obvious. You know, so he can sneak in during the night while Nazim sleeps and Alarm stays up waiting for Jensen to visit. With this in mind, this probably does explain why Alarm has such a strange day-night cycle. Don't forget, once she gets back to the Drunken Huntsman, she stands in the room awake for three hours before going to sleep. Well, what if this daily scheduling is actually a hangover from the planned idea that she'd come home to Nazim asleep and then stay up waiting for Jensen to sneak into Wintersand Manor and uh, teach her how to shout. That's right, those battle cries ain't coming from your Vizca, if you catch my drift. Now, you might be thinking what I thought initially. What if Acolyte Jensen just lives in their grand, giant Wintersand Manor? The same way that Alarm and Nazim live in the Drunken Huntsman. You know, like uh, Jensen just rents a room there because it's a big old house with only two people. Well, that is totally plausible. However, there's an issue. And that is that unlike Alarm and Nazim, Acolyte Jensen is not part of the Wintersand Matter faction, nor is he part of the lock list, which means that he was never meant to be a resident of the household, which leads to the glaring conclusion that Alarm was meant to be cheating on Nazim with her work colleague, Acolyte Jensen. She is unhappily married, she is completely ignored by her husband, and her handsome work friend has a key to her house. I mean, that's pretty conclusive to me. Now, Acolyte Jensen, sadly, like so many in this investigation, does not have any dialogue apart from bog standard lines. Need something? Hmm. <laughs> yeah? Hi. Yes? Hi. Hmm. <laughs> Seems like he's more of the silent type which is the complete opposite of Nazim. So I guess it makes sense that the silent type would definitely be her type at this point. And if you hang around long enough within the Temple of Kinnereth, as I did, you may just witness some uh, pretty handsy behavior between the two within their workplace while Danica Pure Spring watches awkwardly. But I mean, who could blame her? After all, Alarm does know that Jensen has some big, strong magic hands. And along with this, despite being classed as a priest and acting as a priest, Jensen's two primary skills are speech and two-handed. Speech and two-handed. What could he be using those for in this plot? Well, just imagine the seduction that he could perform on alarm with that silver tongue. 
and may the nine divines protect us from our own imaginations as we conjure thoughts about what he could do to her with those two miracle hands of his. And let's not forget that Alarm gets to watch Jensen perform miracles on other women with those hands all day long. She's dying for a session. And to go hand in hand with his two hands is Alarm, who, despite being a priestess and acting as a priestess, her only primary skill is one hand. And obviously Alarm being very skilled in one-handed activities could be pretty helpful to a strong Nord man like Jensen. But I mean, come on, in reality, like what the hell's going on with those primary skills? Speech for seduction, two-handed for Hong Kong, and one-handed for and to go along with this, one of the few spells that Acolyte Jensen knows is Oak Flesh. That's right, making flesh rock hard. Oh, I can only imagine what that could be used for under the covers. Now, I don't know if I've got my glasses on upside down, but this all seems like one big sexual innuendo joke that a dev put in. Now, anyway, just quickly, this is totally unrelated, but I found it strange and kind of annoying, to be honest. Alarm. Acolyte Jensen and Danica Pewerspring are all classed as priests and all work at the Temple of Kinnereth as priests, healing the sick, injured, and ill, which is all well and good. But guess what? It turns out that Acolyte Jensen is the only one of the three to actually know any spells. He will cast healing spells on the sick. Meanwhile, both Alarm and Danica do not know a single spell. Even in the game files, their spell lists are completely blank. So instead of actually healing people, what, they're just standing over them and waving their hands about? In fact, it seems that Jensen was as annoyed as I am, as at one point he even shoved Danica aside while she was waving her hands about so that he could cast some actual healing magic. I mean, what is this? This is the Skyrim healing equivalent of, oh, I'm sending my thoughts and prayers. Oh, well, thank you very much. All that lets me know is that you know that I need help, and then you're actively doing nothing helpful. Oh, let me guess, did Alarm and Danica change their profile pictures as well to a healing potion? Oh, what saints, Tamriel's been fixed. Well done, you have fixed nothing at all. At one point, I even found Alarm waving a crusty loaf of bread over a moaning victim as their appendix exploded. Like some kind of forgotten red guard witchcraft, a breadmancer. Gah. Anyway, speaking of yeast, it would seem that Alarm and Jensen were supposed to be sleeping together with each other secretly. Hence, Jensen has a key to a house that he does not own nor live in. But again, sadly, we do have to take all this with a little pinch of fire salts, as Winter Sand Manor never actually made it into the game, so we can't know for sure. But. There is another plot point that I am very interested in exploring and you are gonna love. What if Acolyte Jensen has a key to Wintersand Manor so that he could sleep with Nazim? Well, I mean, at this point, the notion seems a bit ridiculous, right? As it's not based on anything. Yet, as it's about to get founded, grounded, and uh, <clears throat> in Nazim's case, pounded. You see, as tends to be my natural knack for some reason, I did a lot of testing for this video which at one point led to me taking all of my clothes off of my female character and then standing right in front of Nazim, putting the wares in the front window, if you know what I'm saying. And this was his reaction. Yes, yes, I haven't got all day. Yeah, there was no reaction. He did nothing, not even a general line like, put on some clothes, which is, you know, what every other NPC would say. However, I took all of my clothes off on a male character and this was Nazim's reaction. Put on a cloth sack at the very least. You're making me unseasonably warm. Oh boy. Suddenly we've got one hot potato on our hands here. Nazim quite literally only gets hot under the collar when he sees very specifically a male character in the nude. Now this is most certainly an oh, interesting moment. Given I am a slave to science, I figured that it could have just been happenstance. So much like Nazim and another notable character, I went deeper. As in the creation kit, I dug through all of the dialogue lines that Nazim can say, and admittedly after about an hour, I found the line that he delivers when he sees a naked 
male player character. Now, when we scroll across, we can see what the conditions are to trigger this line of dialogue from the Zeme. It says PC is male, PC standing for player character. So literally in the game coding, a developer's done this on purpose. Nazim will only deliver this line if the player character is male. Put on a cloth sack at the very least. You're making me unseasonably warm. And as my tests concluded, there is no such reaction from Nazim for a female player character. So this quite actually confirms my suspicions that Nazim is in fact attracted to men, and importantly, and sadly for his wife, not attracted to women. Now, let's just pause and accurately imagine this for a minute. This would 100% explain why Nazim is entirely uninterested in his wife Alam. I mean, just imagine if you were married to the sex that you were not attracted to. I think in that situation, we'd all be distant from our partners in that situation in one way or another. Now, of course, this is not to excuse Nazim from being an all-round insufferable dope, but it does help us understand why he is so uninvolved in his own marriage. He, on a genetic level, has literally no drive to. In fact, he probably has repulsion towards it. So, with this new, rather actually quite revealing knowledge about Nazim in mind, could Jensen have had a key so that he could sneak in and see Nazim? Well, it is entirely possible. It could also explain why Alam seems to hate all men. Alam hates her husband, that's just fine, it makes sense. But what if she kept catching Nazim cheating on her with other men? Everyone who has betrayed her and everyone who has caused her hurt emotionally was a man. So if we imagine this scenario, well, yeah, Alarm would really start to get a pretty negative blanket opinion on all men, as she says. Men are all alike, from Skyrim to Hammerfell. They care only for war and politics and treat their women like cattle. And while I admit this is kind of baseless, but hey, while we're here, let's talk about it. What if Jensen is using those uh, magic hands on both of them? Both at once, both separately. Look, who knows what Jensen was getting up to with that Winter Sand Manor key. But in my heart of hearts, I do find it most likely that Jensen and Alarm are secretly up to no good. After all, they are together all day long. Alarm spends 12 hours a day with Jensen in the Temple of Kinnereth, which is where Jensen lives. While at the same time, Alam does not spend a single waking second with her husband Nazim. He's asleep when she gets home, and when she wakes up, he's already gone. They never see each other. But back to the flip side of the septum, Alam and Jensen spending all of this time together stewing in each other's scents, eyeing one another all day long. Well, if the two periodic chemicals of Alam and Jensen were reactive, well, they've had plenty of time to figure that out and act upon it. Therefore, I personally, and I'm sure along with you, find it much less likely that Nazim was giving Jensen a sword singing lesson and showing off his shihai. Shout out to the Yakudan law nerds. And as interesting and crazy as all of this is, it does not end there. Oh no, we're not at the top of this mountain yet. As things actually are about to get way, way weirder. As I stumbled upon a whole bunch of very strange goings ons that I am quite frankly amazed no one has ever found, mentioned or discovered before. Anyway, enough pre-sell. Let's now move on to what I think to be the most likely scenario of Nazim and his secret affinity for the male specimen. As we know, Nazim claims to be very close to Jarl Balgruf the Greater, the Jarl of Whiterun, to whom Nazim apparently provides indispensable advice on political matters. I actually advise the Jarl on political matters. My input is invaluable, of course, but this is all probably a bit over your head. Yet we never see Nazim close to the Jarl. Well, I was wondering, what if this is actually a cover story, i.e. Nazim is visiting Dragon's Reach to see the Yarl under the cover of darkness and under some other covers, but he uses this mask that he is a political advisor to act as an explanation if someone were to have spotted Nazim skulking around Dragon's Reach so that before anyone gets the chance to say, hey Nazim, what were you doing around Dragon's Reach? 
Nazim has already provided an explanation to this particular line of questioning were it ever to arise. Now this could be a 200 IQ move, or it could also totally not be the case at all. Now this is all well and good, but Yal Balgraf? Do we have any reason to believe he's attracted to men? Well, that's a good and fair question, and also a tough one to provide titillating solid evidence for. And to be fair, I wouldn't quite call these the best points ever, but I do find them very interesting, and when you clump them all together, something really weird's going on. As you probably know, Yarl Bulgruff the Greater has children, so it would appear as though he has fornicated with women. He has slept with women, bred with women, and produced children. But interestingly, not all of his children come from the same mother, as Frothar and Dagny are said to have the same mother, while Nelkir has a different mother, as he himself says. I know that he still worships Talos, that he hates the Thalmor almost as much as the Stormcloaks do, that he worries about being chased from Whiterun, that he, that I'm, that I don't have the same mother as my brother and sister. So this alone would imply that Yel Balgraf has not been able to settle down easily with a woman. In fact, there's no motherly figure to be found at all. Maybe the skeleton beneath the Dragon's Reach Bridge is the mother of these children that Balgraf had disposed of. Look, honestly, that's super unlikely, but this goddamn skeleton belonged to someone and we still don't know who, so you know, it's worth a mention. But with that said, Yal Balgraf does not have a girlfriend. He does not have a partner. He does not have a wife. He does not have a horde of concubines. There are no female love interests in any sense of the word in his life and there are no mothers or mother figures to any of his children. This is actually quite obscure given Skyrim's medieval-ish setting, and given that Yal Balgraf is a man of great power and status in his mid-life. Generally speaking, in these medieval fantasy settings, it's much like such times in real life. If you're a man of status and power and position, you marry young, and if your wife passes away, you instantly marry someone else. And if she passes away, you instantly marry someone else. And if she passes away, you instantly marry someone else. Yet, there's no partner of Balgruff anywhere to be seen. There's no names of women. There's no mothers that are mentioned, heard of uttered in the shadows, there's no paperwork, there's no references to any mothers ever. And to make things even weirder, Nelkir, Balgraf's youngest child, well within the creation kit, Nelkir is actually labelled as Balgraf's brother, not his son, his brother. Wait a minute, could it be that these children aren't even his at all? We've got children from different mothers, there's no women slash mothers to be seen, heard of or named, and a child who is actually a brother? Huh? Well guess what, even stranger yet is the Yal's other two children. As while Nelkir is labelled as Yal Balgraf's brother, Frothar and Dagny have no relationships in the creation kit, which means that they aren't his children slash she is not their dad slash no one knows who their parents are. They are literally miscellaneous unknown children. This was way too weird for me to handle, so I checked all 44 children within Skyrim, within the creation kit, and every single child in the game who has NPC parents in the game, all, hear that again, all of them have the correct parent slash child relationship status within the creation kit. Yet, the only two children in the game of Skyrim that are missing any kind of parental tags or even sibling tags are probably the two most important, I use that word loosely, children in the game of Skyrim. When I say important, I mean there's 44 kids in Skyrim. If you think of children in Skyrim, you can probably think of like six, three of which would be the Jarl's kids. So this is an anomaly, and it's a very suspicious anomaly that renders, if true, Frothar and Dagny as not Balgraf's children. So it would seem that no, the Jarl of Whiterun Balgruff the Greater has in fact not bedded a woman and created offspring. There's literally no evidence of that. In fact, there's evidence going the other way. Now we will loop back to this meaning that Balgruff is not into women, therefore he could be into men. But obviously the question is whose children are these? We've got some parentless children running around as the Jarl's children, which if they're not his, he knows that, yet still actively has them in Dragon's Reach, presented as his own children? 
Well, okay, the first step of this is I think that they might be the children of Jarl Balgruf's other, more age-appropriate brother, Hrongar, who lives in Dragon's Reach and, to be quite frank, is a bit of a meathead. I'm not a man. I'm a weapon in human form. Just unsheath me and point me at the enemy. As he doesn't seem like the type to want kids or have kids and stick around, but he does seem like the type to knock up a bunch of thick Nord babes down at the uh, old Bannered Mare there and father a gang of bastard children. And interestingly, along with this, the Jarl himself, he never interacts or spends time with his supposed children. While Hrongar does spend many hours of the day in the company of Frothar and Dagny, but not Nelkir, who would also be the brother of Hrongar along with the brother of Balgraf according to the creation kit. It's all very confusing, I know. But anyway, in short, could Dagny and Frothar actually be Hrongar's bastard children that Jarl Balgraf took full advantage of? What he did was take these two otherwise bastard street urchin children, present them as his own children, which gave them a place to live, a safe place, a nice place to live, Dragon's Reach which is a nice thing to do, but the true genius is at the same time he built himself a shield, a cloak to disguise his true sexual proclivities from the potential rather close-mindedness of the Nordic populace. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, it would seem. Regardless of that, the theory still stands and it's there right in front of our eyes. I would be amazed if I was the first to pick up on this. At least I've never heard of this line of thought before. Jarl Balgraf's whole family is literally a charade. It's one big fat illusion that we will be fooled by no longer. But what does this actually mean? Well, to me, it smells like the kind of facade that a man who is not openly gay, but is of a high rank and status within a pretty rough tumble area of the world, well, it's the kind of thing they might build to protect themselves from the potential bigotry of a medieval setting like Skyrim. Now, along with this super suspicious fake family Yarl, let's loop back to Nazim and not forget that Alam says this. Looking for my husband, Nazim? Check the Jarl's backside. That's usually where he stuffs himself these days. Now, of course, at face value, this is just a metaphor, but what if it's not? What if it is, in fact, quite literal? Don't forget that Alam hates men. All men are the same. And she really hates her husband, Nazim, who, and I quote, stuffs himself in the Jarl's backside. Well, with all of the questionable evidence that we've uncovered, this line could take on a very literal meaning and be a figure of speech no more. Then we must also not forget that Nazim was meant to live in the Cloud District, right next to the Jarl. Which makes it even more likely that uh, the Jarl and Nazim were meant to, you know, visit each other's Telvanni Towers, so to speak. But I mean, who could blame the Jarl? We all know the stereotype about Red Guards. They have massive, curved swords, which within Skyrim is quite a novelty. Who could pass that up? So, was Nazim sneaking up into Dragon's Reach to give the Jarl a Dragon's Reach around? Was he actually stirring that pot of stew to be helpful or was he practicing for old Bulgruff there? Well, who can say as there is so much cut content and unimplemented concepts around Nazim and his place within Whiterun? Who knows what was meant to truly be? Although, at the very least, I am fairly certain that Nazim is not interested in women at all, but instead men. In fact, inside the Drunken Huntsman, where he lives, I even caught Nazim breaking into Anoriath's bedroom to sit and watch him sleep. Along with this, when Nazim leaves and enters the premises, he exclusively only uses the back door. Wink wink. All of these hints were right under our noses. But jokes and quips and memes aside, I think that there is most certainly more than enough evidence to say that Nazim is in fact gay and struggling to exist in a heterosexual relationship or marriage. And along with this, I think that Jarl Balgraf is also gay and struggling with this as a man of status and power within Skyrim. And if this line of thought is not true in regards to the Jarl, well, at the very least, something really wacky's going on with his family. 
His children that don't have parents, Nelkis, his brother, like what the, huh, what, huh, what, who? But anyway, in an ideal world, while well, yes, Nazim and Alam's marriage is in shambles, I truly do hope that Alam is getting it on with Jensen and Nazim is getting it on with Yarl. So yes, while they both are unhappy at home, they are at least finding happiness and romantic fulfillment elsewhere. Naturally, an investigation that leads down this road into such a relationshipy kind of sigil stone has left the doors fully unlocked and wide open for uh, some fan fiction. I look forward to seeing that down in the comments later. But such trifling and complex topics such as love are all in a day's work when it comes to investigating the Elder Scrolls series and its many strange and interesting stories. So I do hope that you've learned something new about the beautifully mad universe that these wonderful games take place in, The Elder Scrolls. If you do have any information, facts, evidence, speculation, theories, or anything to do with Nazim, Alam, Janssen, the Jarl, or any of the other colorful cast of characters that we've covered in this video, I would love to hear what you have to say. If you have any ideas for something that should be covered in an Elder Scrolls detective video, be sure to let me know. I will look into whatever strange and obscure topics that you present. If you did enjoy this video, please do me a kindness and leave a like to help others know that you did enjoy it. Leave a comment with your Elder Scrolls detective video ideas and your thoughts on the ever memeable and apparently quite complex character of Nazim. And of course, if you enjoyed this and you want to see more videos similar to this one, please subscribe. It helps me know that you enjoyed this kind of video and it will result in more of them in the long run if enough people like it. Be sure to click the little bell icon next to the subscribe button right here on YouTube so that you are notified when a new Elder Scrolls Detective video is uploaded. My other Elder Scrolls Detective videos can be found down in the description via the Elder Scrolls Detective playlist link. Down there are also links to all of my social media. Be sure to check all of that out and keep up to date with what I'm up to between videos by following me on Instagram, Twitter, and of course on Twitch. And of course, the most important one, be sure to check out the merch store. There's a ton of cool Elder Scrolls related stuff on there, most of which I painstakingly designed myself. It's a fantastic way to support what I do here on the channel while also getting something very cool for yourself. Or if you did enjoy this video and you would like to help support the channel in a more personal way, grab some hot merch, become a patron on Patreon, become a member with a join button right here on YouTube, or you can drop a super thanks with the, believe it or not, super thanks button right below the video. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is always most genuinely appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. I've been Camel, and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I will see you there soon.